Welcome to Emmanuel Church Glenhaven Bible Talks. Our church loves to engage with God's written word, the Bible, as we gather week by week. If you missed a sermon or want to hear it again, we pray that your time here today will refresh and renew you as you follow Jesus. Today we continue our series of sermons called Word Became Flesh from the Gospel according to John. In John's account of the life and teaching of Jesus, he records only seven of Jesus' miracles. He calls them signs because they point to whom Jesus is. Some were public, like the feeding of thousands of people with a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish. Others were seen by only a handful of people, like changing water into wine. In this talk, Hayden Smith takes us to the fifth sign in the Gospel according to John, witnessed only by his disciples. They were stuck in a storm in a small boat when Jesus came to them walking on the water. The disciples had yet more insight into Jesus' identity, which no doubt strengthened them to keep following Jesus when many others turned away. Hayden challenges us to stick with Jesus, even when life overwhelms us. But before we hear from Hayden, let's listen to the Bible. The passage is John chapter 6, verses 14 to 21. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake, where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about five or six kilometres, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water. And they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I. Don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now, here's Hayden. Father, we do thank you for this time together. We thank you for your holy scriptures that you caused to be written for our sakes, that we might learn more about Jesus, and not merely learn, but put our faith in him, and love you and our neighbour as ourselves. We pray for the help of your Holy Spirit to do so. In Jesus' name, Amen. Our daughter, Tally, has a gift for comic timing. Um, she, I remember um, when Tally was six years old, we were in Bali for my brother's wedding, and we were visiting a tourist site which was filled with wild monkeys. And our group consisted of some who were older, as well as children in strollers. And unfortunately, it included some food in which the monkeys took a great deal of interest. As packs of monkeys descending, the group quickly became anxious and we had to jettison the food, we had to hold handbags and babies close by and we began calming down the adults and children. We circled the wagons, forming a line of defence, at which point I gently chided the group, OK, everyone breathe, we're OK, the last thing we need is panic. At which point Tally took it upon herself to yell, the monkeys are going to kill us all! Uh, which didn't entirely help matters. <laughs> in a similar vein, when Tally was seven, she and I took a boat trip from the mainland island in Fiji to a smaller island some 20 kilometres off the coast. On one of these trips we took a large ferry, but on another occasion we took a small boat some three metres long with a small outboard motor. Later this year we're heading back to that same island and Tally told me just yesterday, I am not going on that little boat. Why, I asked. Because, she replied, with a mix of deadly seriousness and humour, because last time I went on that boat, there was a storm. 
not to mention sharks. That was the sketchiest boat I've ever been on. And I've been on three boats. It was a person killer. I will not be eaten by a crocodile. Fair enough. And so on the basis of that feedback, we're going to be catching the larger boat when we go to Fiji later this year. But Talitha is on to something. Boats are dangerous, or more specifically, water is dangerous. And today's passage, an eyewitness account, retells the story of one such dangerous water crossing and what we learn about Jesus through that story. But before we get to boats, we need to start with the end of the previous story, a story about bread. Mark 6 is split up into a bit about bread, then a bit about boats, then a bit more about bread. And at the end of the feeding of the 5,000, that's the first bit, something unusual happens. Jesus withdraws. He went up on a mountain where he could be alone, it says. And in Mark's Gospel, which records these same events, it's not just that he withdraws, he actually sends the crowds away. He actually sends the disciples away. Presumably, he agrees to meet them on the far shore the next day, which is what is meant in verse 17 of our reading, Jesus had not yet joined them, presumably he planned to. But the primary reason for sending these people away is so that Jesus can be alone. Why had Jesus chosen to be alone? Or, more specifically, drawing again on Mark's Gospel, why does Jesus need time alone in prayer? It's because of what's happened in the verse before. I'll read to you from verses 14 and 15. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. And Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. The crowds wanted a coronation and they wanted their king to march with them to the capital. The Jewish nation at that time was occupied by the Roman Empire, just as they'd been previously occupied by the Ptolemies, the Seleucids and the Hasmoneans. God had promised Abraham, you might recall this in Genesis 12, that God's people would be a great nation, but this is not their present lived experience. And so the people of Judea were looking for not a mere messenger from God, but a military ruler who would drive out this foreign empire, who would restore Israel's fortunes, who would give glory to God again. And in many ways, in John's gospel, the political momentum is with Jesus. There were 5,000 men present when Jesus fed the crowds. And as Paul pointed out to us last week, well, why do they only count the men? Presumably there were more than 20,000 people there who received bread and received fish, who received their lunch. Why were only the men counted? Well, as Bible teacher and commentator Don Carson notes, the specification of 5,000 men is a way of drawing attention to a potential guerrilla force of eager recruits, willing and able to serve the right leader. And it's not just the crowds who are eager recruits. Peter, the representative of the disciples, is one who vows later in John's Gospel to lay down his life for the cause of Jesus. He is the one who takes up a sword and strikes Jesus' enemies when they come to arrest him. Plus, if we're talking about power, have you not been paying attention to Jesus' miracles? He has done extraordinary things. And to draw from Matthew's Gospel this time, chapter 26, we learn that Jesus has at his command angelic armies who are waiting to act at his bidding. And when we read in John chapter 12, The Jewish crowds, they are waiting for Jesus in Jerusalem. They want him to come to them like a mighty king, riding on a carpet of palm leaves. What a simple thing it must have been for Jesus to liberate his people, to give them what they longed for, to evict Tiberius Caesar from Judea, to restore their dignity. And in so doing, Jesus could avoid his untimely death. And he could accept their praise and thanks as the conquering king. Jesus goes away to pray as he reflects upon what kind of Messiah he is and the mission that God has given to him. 
We have in our church a number of doctors, including John Oates, Steve Williams, Jennifer Pisa, Helen Williams, George Castalis, Fran Pengley, and Robin Rahl is well on the way to becoming a doctor. So if you are feeling unwell, you will be well cared for in this congregation. But if I were to ask John Oates to offer advice on a persistent cough, he might struggle. Is that right? Because he's not a medical doctor, but rather he has an academic doctorate in, I think, biomedicine, something to that effect. Something fancy. Um, And if I were to ask George Costalis on how our attitudes to success and failure shape our growth in learning, he might find that difficult because he's a GP whereas Robin Rahl's doctoral work is in precisely this area of education. And whilst I'm sure that Steve Williams is one of the best when it comes to the field of anaesthetics, when it comes to women's health, he is not your man. Fran Pengley is your woman. We've got lots of doctors, but a doctor is not a doctor is not a doctor. You've got to figure out, what kind of doctor do I need? And it's the same when we come to thinking about messiahs. There were lots of would-be saviours at the time of Jesus, but the question is not, are you a Messiah? But if you are the Messiah, well, what kind of saviour are you? Jesus, on reflection, is very clear about what kind of saviour he is, about what kind of kingdom he is. And he will not be made king by force, nor will he exert his kingdom by force, for we read in John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews, but now my kingdom is from another place. It seems that Jesus is not a mere military messiah. Rather, Jesus here at this crossroads in his life and ministry. Here he is offered earthly honour. And yet Jesus chooses not to accept this present honour but to receive the coming hour that is spoken of in John's Gospel. For in John's Gospel, the hour of which Jesus speaks is code for the hour of his death that draws ever nearer. The crowd wanted a politician and a soldier, yet Jesus has come with something bigger in mind, as the next account explains. John 6, verses 16 to 19. When evening came, his disciples were down, went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened. For context here, this sea, the Sea of Galilee, is 21 kilometres long and 11 kilometres wide at its widest part. That is a long way to swim if your boat capsizes. According to Mark's Gospel, the time of this event was before dawn, the time when it was darkest. And these men were rowing into a fierce headwind. The waters were rough. The disciples, and we translate the word straining here, but the word straining means literally they were in pain as they battled against the waves. And let's not forget, these are not amateurs. Four out of the disciples, Peter, Andrew, James and John, were professional fishermen. This was their lake. They knew these boats. They knew the weather patterns and the winds. They grew up navigating these currents, these depths, these shores, and they know this. They are in deep trouble right now. I am confident that my tally would not have coped with this situation. But however scared they were before, They were more scared still when they saw this apparition walking on the water. Mark chapter 6, verses 49 to 50 records, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. A phantom almost certainly, but is it for them or is it against them? Whatever this was, it was not merely natural, it was supernatural. And then they realise it's Jesus and the same question begs, Is he natural or is he supernatural? The answer, of course, is both. And this Jesus in verse 20 and 21 says, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. Remember, his encouragement to not be afraid goes hand in hand with his teaching about who he truly is. In effect, he says, Don't be afraid, 
because of who I am. You need not be afraid if you recognize who I am, which of course begs the question, well, who are you? These signs, while they speak for themselves, especially when we take into account speaking in the context of the Old Testament scriptures, these are the scriptures that the disciples would have known all too well. So, for example, consider Psalm 77, verse 16, and Job chapter 9, verse 8. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. And it is God alone who stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. You can hear the cogs turning over in the disciples' minds. God alone walks on the water and yet you are walking on the water. What does that say about you? And God alone has the power to save from the waters. This is a longer reading. It's taken from Psalm 107 verses 23 to 30. But as you listen to it, you might realise, though it's written of, in Psalm 107, it could well be speaking of John chapter 6. Some went out on the sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke and stirred up a tempest that lifted high the waves. In their peril, their courage melted away. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper, and the waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Mighty waters, fearful sailors, a God who rescues and brings them safely to the shore. Again, you can hear the disciples thinking, God alone is the one who rescues people from the waters and yet here you are, Jesus, saving people from the waters. What does this say about you? The disciples are beginning to realise that the very word of God that called these waters into being at the creation of the world, that word, to use the language of John 1, that word now walks among them. And it is this God this Jesus who says to them, it's me, don't be afraid. And this changes everything about their expectations. Let me ask you a question. How much damage would a 58.4 tonne asteroid make if it hit the Earth? Would it squash a small hatchback? Would it generate a crater so big as to provide a new harbour for the city? Would it be a world-ending event? Well, the European Space Agency has a near-Earth object coordination centre. This is an actual thing. They notice when things bump into the Earth. And they realise that people often grapple to understand the scale of things. I don't really know how big that is or how bad that is. And so they coined a standardised unit for comparison. The unit of measurement for an asteroid that they put forward is an SGU, a standardised giraffe unit. So, for example, a corgi-sized asteroid, or 0.05 of one SGU, that poses little to no threat, unless you are that corgi. Whereas an elephant-sized asteroid, which is 2.5 SGUs, could pose a much more substantial threat to your average suburban duplex. I get more of a sense of this now. I've got some of the sense, how many giraffes would it take to kill me? Not many is the answer. Some of you might be relieved to know that this new taxonomy of space objects was released by the European Space Agency in their April newsletter earlier this year, which was published on what date, anyone? April the 1st. But I'm not going to lie, I found it a bit helpful. I'm trying to figure out how big and small things are to get a sense of perspective, a sense of scale. And sometimes we need a reference point. And I think here in John chapter 6, our sense of scale is altered. At the beginning of John chapter 6, where they're saying, would you mind rescuing us from the Romans? That is a human-sized mission. But now they realise that this is no mere human. This is the word walking amongst us. This is God. Maybe his mission is bigger than that. Maybe he's here to do 
well, God-sized things. And so with this new perspective, Jesus returns after the boat saga to teaching about bread in the second half of John 6, but now with a new sense of who Jesus is and what he's come to do. Because we discover that Jesus offers much more than the crowds were demanding, much more than they'd hoped for. He's not here to take lunch orders. He's not here to take up arms against the Romans. He is here to take up his rightful place as the saviour of the whole world and as the sovereign of all people. And it's this salvation that he speaks of in verse 51. He says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And this bread is my flesh, which I will give on the cross for the life of the world. And indeed, this Jesus, he does give up his life for the world. And he does, as we see in his resurrection, offer eternal life. He offers much more than the people realised at the beginning of John chapter 6. But as we push into John chapter 6, we realise that Jesus demands more as well. Verse 53 to 55, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in them. The idea of uh, eating and drinking Jesus' blood and his flesh does not sound pleasant. But Jesus is intentionally being controversial here to communicate a very important point. That is, we must remain in Jesus. We must be so intimately connected with him that it's like we have ingested Jesus into ourselves. We have become one. And what that means is, if we would share in the blessings of Christ, then we must be so connected with him that we serve Christ with our whole life. You cannot have one without the other. Or at least we must commit ourselves to doing our best to serve Christ with the help of the Holy Spirit. Because when Jesus asks people to come to him in faith, he asks nothing less than that they give him their whole life, as is his right, as the sovereign, not of a mere empire in Rome, but as the sovereign and king of all people. He asks that they give their life for his sake. John 12, 25. If you love your life, Jesus says, you will lose it. But if you give it up in this world, you'll be given eternal life. And it is no surprise that many say, no thank you, I'll keep doing life my way. If that's okay, it's my life, I'll hold on to that. And many people hearing this teaching turn away. At the end of this chapter, verses 60 and 66, on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And from this time on, many of his disciples, that is the broader crowds who had been following him, turned back and no longer followed him. But some do stay because they have followed the signs and they have seen that Jesus is who they hoped he might be. Verses 67 to 69, Jesus says, You don't want to leave too, do you? He asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. Do you know anyone else who's in the business of saving the world? Do you know anyone else who can offer eternal life? Nope, me neither. Which is why I'm sticking with Jesus. And I want to encourage you to do the same. As we come to the end of uh, this chapter... Let me close with three brief applications. Firstly, contrary to the way this passage is sometimes used, this passage cannot be used as a metaphor for your particular circumstances today. Jesus is not walking on the waters of whatever challenge you are facing in your life. And the reason I say that is not through lack of empathy for your situation, but it shows no compassion for me to speak promises to you that Jesus does not make. So the question is, well, what promise does Jesus make to you in your circumstance? 
Well, speaking to his disciples, and in the context of future disciples, which is us, Jesus says this. He promises to be with us in this time of trial by his Holy Spirit, who will, John 14, 16 and 18, this Spirit will help us and will be with us forever. Jesus promises that he will not leave us as orphans. So he is not indifferent, rather he is present with us in these present sufferings. And though it is hard, he encourages us to take heart. For we read in John 16, 33, you will have suffering in this world. Be courageous, for I have conquered the world. Jesus is the one who endured much suffering, but Jesus is the same one who rose victorious over all circumstances and over all powers and principalities. And on the last day, we will see him set all things to rights. I don't know about your storm, but I know this. God's spirit is with you. He is shaping you, even in these circumstances, to be more like Jesus. And you can be sure of this. His salvation is coming soon. So no, this passage is not a metaphor for your life, but there is comfort in the words of Jesus. Secondly, it is hard to read all of this talk of eating and drinking, of eating Jesus' body and drinking his blood without thinking of the Lord's Supper, sometimes called communion or the Eucharist. That's where we eat bread and we eat, drink wine. And we know this meal is important because Jesus told us to do it. We are to serve this meal in remembrance of him. But is it actually Jesus' body? Is the bread his body? Is the wine his blood? Some people say it's just a metaphor. It's just a symbol. It's something we do to help us to remember Jesus. And other people say, no, it is physically the body and blood of Jesus. I, on the basis of what I read in the Bible and in keeping with Anglican teaching, hold that this is not mere symbolism, nor is it Jesus, uh, the bread and wine changed physically, but rather it is a spiritual reality. It is not physically Jesus' body and blood, but it is truly his body and blood, in every way that matters. The 39 Articles of Religion, that's a summary of what Anglicans believe about the Bible, says this, the body of Christ is given... It is taken and eaten in the supper in a heavenly and spiritual matter. And the mean whereby the body of Christ is received and eaten in the supper is faith. What that means is, if you don't believe, you can eat all the bread you like and it will not do you any good. But it does mean that if we come in faith, then through the work of the Spirit in that sacrament, our faith is strengthened which is why saint augustine comments on this passage john chapter 6 by saying this believe and you have eaten already Uh, next week we will come to share in the lord's supper sometimes we have it with the children in next week it'll be just the adults i wonder if you might come with a spirit of reverence for all that christ has done for you and a spirit of joy being thankful for his work in your life and i wonder if you would model when the children are in what it is to treat that moment with seriousness but also with such happiness that Christ would love us and give himself for us. Lastly, by way of application, it would be strange indeed in a passage that is filled with signs that point to the Saviour, in a miracle which speaks directly to the divinity of Jesus, not to ask, what do you think? Who do you think he is? We've had five signs now. Are you beginning to make up your mind? And I want to speak to some who may be in the room now who are still figuring this out. Let me ask you a question. What comes next? So no one told you life was going to be this way. Your job's a joke. You're broke. Your love life's DOA. It's like you're always stuck in second gear when it hasn't been your day, your week, your month, or even your year, but do you want to know what comes next? 
I'll be there for you. It's from the Rembrandts, a great 90s song. All right, I'll choose, I'll choose, I'll choose something different. Okay, how about this? Hey Jude, don't make it bad. Take a sad song and make it better. Remember to let her under your skin, then you'll begin to make it better, 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 better. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> what comes next? That's it, I've got here. Nah, 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 hey Jude. The point is, have you ever noticed this? When someone sings half a song and leaves off the end, it's really annoying, isn't it? You want to finish it. You're like, you're, you're almost there, let's just finish this together. Um, at morning tea, you might want to uh, do this. Just say or sing part of the song and then walk away and watch the person <laughs> squirm. And yet there are some people who, when it comes to Jesus, they have started, but they have not finished the journey of becoming a Christian. If you like, they've sung most of the song, but they haven't completed it. So let me ask you, this is not abstract, I'm talking to you, sitting there in your particular seat. If you're a person who's been coming to church, learning a little more, making some Christian friends, perhaps dabbling in the Bible, maybe even trying prayer. Let me ask you, answer these in your head. And you may not have thought these questions through before. Do you believe that Jesus is real? Do you believe that when he speaks, he tells the truth? Do you believe that he died and rose again? Do you believe he forgives sins? And do you see him through the Holy Spirit, though he is very difficult to see, at work today in ordinary churches like ours and even in your life, helping you to believe and to love God and your neighbour just a little bit better. And do you believe that whether we go to him in death or whether he will return, that one day this Jesus, just as he promised, will fix all the stuff in the world that needs fixing. You might not have thought those questions before, but as you listened along, you might find yourself, perhaps much to your surprise, thinking, gosh, I think I do believe some of those things. Then, dear friend, can I encourage you, do not leave the song unfinished. Say the final lyric. You know what? I think I am a Christian, aren't I? I think I do believe in Jesus. I think I am going to live for him, not perfectly, but I'll, I'll give it a red hot go. Because if you do not finish, take that last step, you've got Hey Jude without the nanas. And the nanas are the best bit. Can I encourage you as we reflect upon who Jesus is and his God sized mission to save the world? Can you finish, will you finish the song? Will you put your faith in Jesus? Because I, I assure you, you will not regret it in this life, nor in the life to come. Amen. Thanks for listening. We trust today's message encouraged you as you follow Jesus. For more information about Emmanuel Church, please visit our website, glenhaven.church. Until next time, bye for now.